Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome, everybody, to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me today Vince Shore. Vince is CEO of the National Financial Educational Council, and I'm going to have him explain a whole lot about that because I think in today's world, it is huge. It's huge for individuals. It's really important for businesses. He has received a lot of attention. He's been featured in USA Today, The Motley Fool. NBC News, The American Banker, The Nerd Wallet, NASDAQ, Market Watch, 401k Specialist, Financial Advisor. So to make a long story short, he has gotten a lot of t- attention because of his credible and really useful uh, approach to what he talks about. He has worked with people and informed them on how to make financial decisions for their lives, for their business, work with about 2,500 people, more than that by now probably, and um, is an advisor to many individuals. So before we get started um, with what you're doing, tell us the audience a little bit about how did you get started down this road? Yeah, I always had a passion and interest in money from a young age. I always had businesses. One of my first ones was tin can collecting. The next one was selling lizards at school, which got shut down. They had to run a black uh, a black uh, backseat uh, lizard business, but I always had an interest. I loved it. It was fun to me. Um, and, and as I started going into high school, I started reading a lot of my dad's investing books on foreclosures and different things like that. So I was in the back of the classroom reading those books, not paying attention to what was going on in school. Um, but I really had an interest. I started investing in real estate and other uh, uh, you know, securities and things early in my life. And I thought I had a great head start. Uh, then college, I got off track and got into student loan debt, got in credit card debt. And I really struggled for three, five years. I was really just worried about getting by, putting food on the table, uh, you know, make sure my always worried my car wouldn't break down. And that it really inspired me to get into financial services. I always enjoyed when I was doing well, people would ask me a lot about money and finance. I love talking about it. So it seemed like a natural extension to me. I spent about 15 years in financial services on and off. And uh, uh, then I was just at a time where I was lost. I'm like, really felt like, okay, I have my finances in order. I really want to look toward that legacy, Right. Um, and in a conversation with my mom, I went up and visited uh, my parents and she said, you know, in, in high school, you always talked about how frustrated you were that they didn't teach money in high school. And that really spawned and, and really reminded me of that spark. And since that day, I turned my focus here toward the National Financial Educators Council in 2006. And we've grown into a company that is focused on promoting financial wellness, well-being, through education and really just empowering people with the mindset, the knowledge and the behaviors uh, to make better financial decisions so they can live their legacy earlier so they can work toward uh, those goals that they have at a younger and younger age. You talk about financial literacy. What does that really mean to you? Yeah, to me, it's a kind of a term that's that's out there. You know, literacy by itself means, hey, you're literate about a topic. So Literacy means like, hey, I can define what ROI means. But to me, financial literacy means, hey, not only having the knowledge, but having the behaviors, the sentiment or overall confidence to make effective decisions, having the team members in place, having the plan and systems that will help support somebody toward that. So knowledge is is great. But in this space, knowledge without action and those other elements does very little. So we really want to look at the holistic version of, of what we've referred to as literacy um, and work help people work toward financial wellness. And what I mean by that wellness is where people are comfortable, 
they're secure, they're able to do those things and, and pursue those uh, chapters in life that they need to. And you need money to do those things, right? And I, I know a lot of people say, hey, there's free things to do. You can go to the beach and all, but everything costs. There's nothing really free, whether it's paying for gas, parking, things do cost money. So we want people to be able to live that life um, and have that security they need to sleep well at night. You know, that security to sleep well, that's huge, right? Um, Literacy is huge. Uh, But we don't, we don't teach it at any level. We used to have really fairly robust programs in high schools on business. And maybe it involved largely knowing how to balance books and do doing bookkeeping. But at least that was something. True. Yeah, and I don't know why that's changed. I I look at the last hundred years of education; most of it's been the same, the same core subjects: history, English, sciences. It's the same core subjects. Now, for a little bit, they had home ec, which was popular sixties, fifties, sixties, and earlier on, it was you know, they had some version of that where it was more, hey, how do you plant in the, the agricultural time? Um, but we've really gotten away from that. You know, when I look at my high school career. I use very little. I have absolutely no need for algebra. I have absolutely no need for a foreign language, right? I enjoyed learning Spanish. I have lots of people speak Spanish around me. I didn't need to know it for any business thing. Uh, I could care less about chemistry, biology. I have some interest. I'll turn on you know, Netflix, watch a documentary on the minks in Antarctica. Yeah, it's interesting or the photosynthesis, but it does nothing for me. And yet the subjects do benefit maybe, you know, 10, 15% of people going into the sciences, going into mathematics and so forth, but it alienates a huge amount of people like myself. I had absolutely no interest in school because of that. And these kids, you know, financial literacy and personal finance is something that benefits 100% of students. And it's especially the students that are coming up from lower socioeconomic statuses where it's even especially more important for them. And it's still not taught. So one of our missions here at the NFEC is really promoting financial education in schools. It's a battle. We've been doing it for quite a while. Um, but until then, we always encourage parents to be actively involved. And, and thanks for bringing that up because it's it really requires us to raise awareness for parents to let them know it's not being taught. You are the final line of defense before they go out and make those first few financial decisions. You know, we're right now we're really caught in hot debates over what is appropriate education, right, in the schools. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a lot of opinion education that is being uh, provided. But is that really going to be what will push the needle forward in people's lives? Especially, I I I like what you're saying about what are we doing with our um, more challenged, disadvantaged peoples who who really need the encouragement, the help to get out of poverty, to look at something different. And it requires some tools, doesn't it? It it definitely does, you know, and and just seeing, you know, one of my first volunteer, when I started, I was trying to speak and get out there. One of my first volunteer roles was at the Orange County Juvenile Hall System. And it was a tough crowd, right? A tough crowd being new. I was nervous and so forth and trying to, you know, find my voice. Uh, But what I found there is they were highly, highly intelligent on personal finance matters, right? They were business people. Now, they they called themselves street pharmacists, right? So we kind of know what they did, but they were highly, highly intelligent on those business matters. They knew budgeting. They knew these things, um, but they had generations of family in prison and so forth. And it's like just being able to shape them into a, 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 a business that has a lot less risk. And that's good for people. I remember one student still to this day, and he loved working on cars, right? Loved it, worked on everybody's cars, family's cars, and he just, that was his thing. And we had a class on, hey, what what do you enjoy, right? And I I kind of walked him through the process of starting a business. And he's like, you know, I never thought of that. And it's, you know, he's thinking, oh, I have to have this big corporation. It's like, no, just start doing cars, take some photos, Put some things, share them with your friends and family, then start to charge. You don't need business licenses, all this stuff. You can worry about that later. Right now, let's just start to shift your time to this. That's where your skill is. That's where your passion is. 
but he had the foundation there already. So I think schools, it's really important, especially in homes where they may not have a, a great role model. Schools need to take that ownership and say, hey, we're going to help transform you. We're going to teach you 21st century skills so you can get a job. So you know how to talk to a potential employer. So you have your resume in place. And so when you do get a job, you know what to do with that money. So you're not having to work that job, you know, for another 80 years if it's not your passion type project, right? Um, it makes logical sense to me, <laughs> but I don't know why they want to you know, bring in all these controversial subjects, things like that. It's like, hey, we know this works. And most people want personal finance taught in school. We do a survey each year and says, hey, do you wish you were taught about money in school? Always every year over 80% said, yes, I wish I did. And we do a separate survey that says, should it be taught in schools? The vast majority of people say, yes, it should. Um, so I think we have the the, 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 you know, we're on the right side of the uh, push. Um, it's just getting into these things that are so, you know, there's so much red tape and, and different stakeholders are fighting that. Um, we really need to make that happen. And, and even the states that do bring in financial education, it's at such a low level. They'll be, you know, do like five, 10 hours of training before they leave. It's too late. Kids are developing habits by age seven to nine on their finances. And we wow. need to shape that from an early age and then prepare them for real life decisions that they'll make student loans, moving out on your own, what accounts to open, how to manage those before they leave the security of that family unit or that school unit. I remember years and years ago, years ago now, you had, this was an elementary school, you had bank accounts and you would come every Friday and you'd have a certain amount of money that you could deposit into a bank. And you bring the money, the school would then deposit into your account. And you would keep track of what happens when you do that. I remember that as a child, too. My parents, we had an account with World Bank. I don't know if they're still around, but I remember the globe and the, my, my passport. And then I'd go in and, you know, I'd get excited when I see a couple pennies of interest. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, it just it was an exciting thing. And my mom's like, OK, bring in your allowance here. We'll put this in. We'll look at your account. I mean, that was valuable experience to me. And it's those simple things parents can do, those teachable moments. Hey, you're out shopping with kids and saying, hey, you know, here's why I'm choosing this soup over this one. It's healthier, but also this one's cheaper per ounce, right? So getting into those teachable moments, um, it doesn't have to be the formal, hey, let's sit down and study finance. We can do it at a lot of times. So there's a lot of those moments available for parents. And for a lot of people, it's using the teachable moments because they're not sit down learning types of people. Yes. They're experiential type of people. Talk a little bit about business. We also don't teach entrepreneurs how to have a successful business. And so we see a lot of businesses failing. Talk a little bit about what are some of the basics and are those things that you provide? Definitely. Part of, you know, I think, you know, as when we look at financial literacy, we look at income, you need income to manage money. So business, career, that's the, you know, the backbone to being able to manage anything, right? Um, so I think it's an important thing. Um, and, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is key. And there's so many opportunities today for people to learn business from a step-by-step you know, way. So you can do those side hustles, people call them, you know, the Ubers, those things, but that can help build the business basics. And as you and I talked before the show, a lot of it comes down to how we budget and our cash flow, right? So those management. So when we can build these skills in small ways, I had many businesses before this, they weren't huge successes. Um, and, and they were just kind of passing the fleeting moments, nothing I really wanted to really build. Um, but I learned a lot along the way, right? How to communicate, what systems do I need? Um, you know, how to separate my you know, business side from my personal side, how to know what was really coming into the business and was it viable to continue? So all these things you can learn along the way. And the other great thing about you know, uh, business education is there's so many ways to learn. Shows like this, books, authors, you know, short YouTube videos. There's so many ways to learn today. Uh, people can really find that person that resonates with them, listen on a consistent basis and, and follow those, those steps. Um, and I think that's a critical skill, uh, uh, you know, just for even employers. A lot of employers are looking for that entrepreneurial minded type person. In fact, our COO, Trevor Stoll, 
Uh, he actually was an intern at University of California, Riverside, very entrepreneurial minded. Uh, I, we were doing a lot of different college things. He reached out and said, hey, can I do something on my campus, right? Um, that's how he started. He went to graduate school, circled back. He's been with us 12, 13 years now um, and just grew, you know, from that, you know, thing. And he set up a great event, you know, booths and people went by. But that's very entrepreneurial spirited. And, and that's what I look for when I hire people. Hey, can I give some some guidance and some idea where things are at? And can you put together the pieces and add in your own flavor? So I think even to be successful in a job uh, where you're not worried about losing it, uh, when you're bringing those entrepreneurial skills in, that's that's a key. Uh, in addition, for people that want to start businesses, there's so many opportunities, as I said earlier, whether it be that big scale legacy project you want to work toward um, or those stair step businesses that are good building blocks for what you need for that legacy project. So right now, Vince, we see the economy taking a nosedive. A lot of pressures for for individuals, pressures for businesses. So what do you say to people in terms of how do you manage that? Does your thinking change? Do you approach things differently in these kinds of times? Or what is it that you do? Yeah, the, the first thing I do is I, I want to, you know, I've just seen so many times when things go against people, and I'll just share my own personal experience. When I was in college and saw these credit card bills coming in every month, um, I did not want to look at the bills. I did not want to open them. I did not want to face them. Three, four years before when I was getting rent checks and my portfolio was going up, I was, as soon as they came in, I would open those things up. I'd want to look at them, right? Um, so when, when something is not going your way, oftentimes we want to shun it. We don't want to look at it. I mean, it's tough, especially now a lot of people, you know, they're just getting ahead. You know, they're just seeing the end of debt. They're seeing, you know, this blue skies and then inflation, then, you know, the recessionary pressures, then, you know, gas costs, all these things are just bearing them back down and it's scary for people, right? Um, so first I want to acknowledge you're going to feel that way, um, but it's also important to stay focused. It's, I think, an important time to reassess your budget. Um, because a lot of things have changed in a year, year and a half. A ton has changed. The cost of goods, everything, your budget that you had two years ago is no longer valid today. So take a look at that. Um, I know it's hard, um, but that's the critical foundation. So you know, hey, what's coming in, what's coming out um, and make those necessary changes. Also, it's a time that we have to face, you know, not there's really no fun decision. We can either cut back spending or we can earn more. Right. So it's either work harder or work more and cut back spending. Right. So it's, it's, it, there's, there's no like fun decision. Uh, that always makes it more challenging for people to face that. Um, but I think it's critical, especially during these times. We don't know how long these pressures are going to exist. We don't know what the future holds. As we saw with COVID, things change overnight. My thing is, hey, I want you secure and not have to worry and starting to prepare in case anything happens in the future. So I would say right now to people, again, I wish I had the golden egg that would just make you feel better, lighter, and, and just, you know, ready to tackle it. But it, it's going to be something you have to open up that envelope. You have to look at what's inside. Um, and it, once you start some momentum and working toward progress, you'll get, uh, you know, that, that moment, at least I feel a little more encouraged as I'm starting to see little progress. Um, and, you know, just uh, hopefully you can let the past go. It's very tough. Um, and I, I just wish you the best on, on that journey as well. So we talked a little bit, Vince, about the challenges. It's that sense of it's depressing to open a bill you can't pay, right? Yeah. Well, what are some of the other challenges that people have relative to their finances? It's financial planning in a sense, but it's more basic than even that, isn't it? Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think one of the things that uh, we see quite a bit is not planning just uh, for the future needs, right? You, you have a budget for now, but you're not thinking about, you know, uh, your, your, your kids, college, if you're going to pay or not. Uh, you're not thinking about maybe, hey, you have an aging parent that may need to live with you and may need some support. Um, it, it's that type of planning often people forget, even like the annual gym membership, right? You have a budget that's working now, then that, you know, $300 bill comes in for the gym and you're like, oh, I forgot about this or that, you know, DMV notice, whatever. 
Um, so, you know, having a strategy and overall plan is critical. Uh, you know, one of our roles here at the NFC, we train coaches um, and financial coaches, specifically on the financial side. Um, and, you know, that, that's a big thing people aren't doing. So they're saying, hey, they look good now, but when I'm asking them about their plans, they're not nearly saving enough for these up and coming things. And what happens when they get there? Well, it either goes on a credit card, comes out of savings or comes out of retirement, which messes other things up. So the more we can look ahead, the more we can plan and strategize, uh, the better it is. And uh, same thing with business too. Um, as, as you know, it's like in, in the manufacturing business you came from, if you didn't plan four or five steps ahead, maybe the cost of goods are rising or things, you could have been in serious trouble. So uh, I think it's personal finance is a great skill set to develop for business finance and managing that business. So it's going to scale and, and continue to, to prosper. That whole scaling to prosper is huge. And, and yet we make decisions that don't always align with what we want in our hearts. We want, we want to succeed. We want a business that thrives. We want to have a personal financial life that, that does well. What is it that keeps us from aligning our, our actions with what we want? Yeah, I think there's a lot of factors that go in there. One of the biggest ones we see is just, you know, habits and consumerism type habits, right? And they're formed young. Uh, you probably see this, but, you know, they're advertising to little kids, very highly sophisticated ads to make purchases. Hey, you need these shoes to be cool. Look at all these kids frolicking with all these new clothes and, and so forth. So there's a huge amount of pressure on kids from advertisers. We see social influencers as well that are kind of piggybacking on that. Um, you know, one of the most popular channels overall on YouTube theme channels is kids unboxing videos where they're opening up things that they buy or gifts. And in the teen world, it's called the hauling videos where they're going shopping, laying out all their things, you know, on, on the bed. So we have a huge amount of pressure to buy you need this to have esteem. You need this to be cool. And then you see your friends with the clothes and, and so forth out there that uh, have that. So I think at a young age, you know, people are always trying to keep up with the Joneses. If uh, I go back to older saying, but for those uh, younger listeners, it means keeping up with your neighbors. And back then, you know, in, in the 50s and in early 60s, when this term was very popular, it was keeping up with the neighbors on your street. If Frank got a color TV, you got a color TV, right? Or they got a new car, you got a new car. That, that was it. But now the Joneses are really a global thing. You have friends in all over the world. You're seeing content from, you know, all over the country, all over the world as well. So there's this much higher level of Joneses. And, and again, the ads toward kids are just is very sophisticated. So I think a lot stems from a hey, wanting to have that persona. You know, I think some of the most successful business people, if we look at, you know, some of the people that did their work in the garage, uh, it was Bill Gates and, and, and the Apple gentleman. Uh, we look at, you know, other people that, you know, really kept their overhead low. It's not about what you look like early on. It's about making sure your company is successful. As a business owner, you not only have responsibility for yourself, but every single employee. If you mess things up, it's going to impact these people's lives that are relying on you. Uh, so I always, you know, one of my biggest things is, hey, <laughs> operate well under your means. Um, this way you have the freedom to do so. And I come from the mortgage industry uh, 15, 20 years ago. And all my buddies in there, you know, they, they saw all the credit reports come through. They saw the trouble people got into. They saw all this. And yet, what do they do? Car, house, boat. ATV trailer. And when rates went up, like we're experiencing now, you know, the, what do they sell? Boat, car, you know, or lost, right? So all that thing. And they saw this over and over. I never understood it, but I, you know, what in my communication with them is largely just, Hey, I wanted to have this because everybody else was getting, I, you know, I want to have fun too, but it was more, everybody else was doing it. Um, and fortunately I didn't get in that trap. Uh, I've always been quite frugal. Um, but there's people that aren't right. Um, so I'd say, Hey, just make sure you're living well under your means, especially in those early years of starting the business. There's a lot of things that can come up, economic challenges, 
um, just, you know, a big client goes, uh, you know, maybe a marketing thing dries up for you. So how do you ensure that you're going to prosper in the future? It's by getting through those challenges that every business faces and how we do that is making sure there's more, uh, uh, you know, uh, money set aside that you can pour toward that if you do choose. You know, we hear so much today about, um, having that successful life. And so in business, it's having that, what the, the laptop lifestyle. Yeah. And um, I, I have heard it so much and I have seen people's work habits that have that belief system that if somebody uses those words, I go stay away because <laughs> it means I'm paying for your vacation, not mine. And very true. Right. And but we have a different expectation. It seems we've we've sold a different expectation to people. It's like, of course, everybody should and does deserve this laptop life, but it has to be earned. I agree. And I think, you know, too, I, I, when I go to these high schools still and talk to these kids, a lot are, hey, they're looking to be that YouTube star. They're looking to be that. It's like, okay. Wonderful. Just like that, you know, we did a lot of work with professional athletes. It's like, hey, great, go for it, right? But let's make sure there's a, some other plan in place so that hey, if you're not that next YouTube star, that Logan Paul or whoever's out there, um, you know, you have a plan in place uh, to to go to, right? Um, and I think it's always you know, important. Hey, if they want to work toward whatever it is, as long as you're not, you're actually working, right? You don't live that laptop lifestyle unless you're actually working and earning money. You can live that for very short periods, right? And people do. Um, but hey, if you want that, I want that for you as well. Make sure your foundation is good. Make sure you're at that desk working hard, you know, not just working for three hours and go and, and enjoy Tahiti for the rest of the day, right? And why would you want a laptop lifestyle unless you're going to spend most of the time having fun? You need to put in the work. You need to put in the dedication. And through that, we're going to grow into that lifestyle. But, you know, I think uh, uh, people think that's more the norm than the <laughs> than the way out there on the bell curve uh, type lifestyle. So a uh, great point there. <laughs> Vince, you have coaches. Who do they, how do they coach? Who do they coach? And how would people um, get a coach from your company? Our coaches are, are really specific toward personal finance, okay. but we also understand that behaviors, other factors play a huge role. So, you know, we're just not looking at the analytical side, the numbers and dollars. We're looking at, hey, what are your goals? And a lot of it is, you know, that that discussion, right? A lot of people don't talk about money. Uh, we do a deep analysis. Our coaches do. They look at 31 indicators of your financial health, right? So we have a full picture on, hey, where you're at. And I always say the coaches know more about your finances than you ever did. In addition, more than let's see your realtor, your mortgage broker, anybody else, simply because we're looking at your overall finances, not just one product specific. Um, so, you know, we always say what we see our coaches work with are people that are at a point in time. They're like either fed up. Hey, I need to make a change. I'm ready to face this and, and, and make a change. Or, hey, there's this life event I really want, and it's super motivational to me. Maybe it's having a kid. Maybe it's wanting to buy that dream home, right? So those seem to be the common motivators for, for people to do so. But I really encourage people, at you know, the younger they can start, the younger they can do their plan, even though it doesn't feel pressing now, in 10 years it might. And you lost 10 years. So I always encourage the youth of today, those younger people, maybe just out of college or, or even high school, if you're starting to work, is, is to talk with somebody that can give you independent guidance. They have a fiduciary responsibility to you. They're not selling products or, hey, you know, trying to get you in a debt payoff plan or, or you know, a debt product or, you know, pay for your credit repair. They're helping guide you. So you're picking up the knowledge so you can do those things yourself. So the next time in your future, you're empowered to make those decisions. You're confident. Sometimes we just need to bounce some ideas off people, right? I was thinking this, is that right? And once somebody says yes, you're like, okay, I can move faster. What I find is when people have questions, it's it slows them down, right? Even in business today, when I have a question, I'm like, 
what do I do? Right. It, it, then I have to spend 15, 20 minutes thinking Then I have to call somebody or talk to somebody. Hey, hey, I have advisors I use to coaches I use. What do I do here? You know, this is my challenge. I, you know, I have these two options. What should I do? And they'll tell me, and I'll be like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I just needed that added security to get the, you know, put my foot on the gas here. So, um, but as you know, with your business, um, it, it, it's a lot about behavior, sentiment, addressing those emotional side of things. A lot of people think money's very analytical. Yeah, some parts of it are, but I would say 90%, give or take some, is behavioral and, and sentiment oriented. You know, it, that is so true. And I think that is um, it. why it becomes so difficult. It goes into the roots of how you were brought up and what you were taught and what your belief system is. And so then you struggle or, or not, depending upon what that perspective was. Vince, this is going so fast and there's so much wisdom here for people. What have we missed that is really important for people to know? Yeah, I, I think we touched on a few things that I think are important right now. Hey, face whatever financial situation you're in, be proactive on your finances. Look for those mentors and people that you can connect with. Lois, anybody else that you feel that personal connection with that feel, hey, that can be a good teacher, educator, motivator for me. Set a regular schedule on things you want to do um, and, and just pursue that. There's going to be challenges and in, 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 in roadblocks in the way at anything we do. Um, and it's staying focused on, on those roadblocks and not letting them uh, set ourselves up. Um, for, you know, anything that uh, we, we're a product of the actions we're taking, right? So whatever regular actions you're doing on a daily basis, if it's studying, focus on building a business, those things, you're going to end up making that product yourself. So I really encourage people to do that. I also let people know, hey, if you're called toward financial education, if you're called for the financial wellness or literacy movement, we're advocates, we're educators, we're coaches, um, if you're called to that, contact us. We'd love to support you and help you. Um, but uh, again, just finding that drive, uh, continue your focus on that education, gaining that knowledge, implementing what you learned. And I do wish you the best through these times as well. Do you work with school boards, Vince? We we do. And uh, we've been pushing, you know, getting financial literacy in schools um, it's challenging, a lot of red tape. I'm, I'm, I like dealing with business people, right? I enjoy that. I like being able to communicate. You and I would have a great conversation. Hey, you know, this is what I was thinking. Does that work? Oh, yeah, maybe if this. School board's not like that. It's like 20 stamps, not logical. They have so many different stakeholders. We are trying to get involved more. So if you have a connection to a school board, we're willing to talk and have that discussion. Um, and we're trying to facilitate this on a larger scale. We're actually releasing a state-by-state -state initiative where we're bringing these, these bigger celebrity sports stars into getting the message out, um, not only to get school boards to open their eyes, um, but also letting them know, hey, it's not just teaching it like a presentation. There's, there's agendas. We need trained teachers. We need testing. We need independent classes, and we need to focus on this at a young age. But Long answer to your question. Yes, we do work with school boards. Okay, great. The other is communities, because I, I'm concerned that we start looking at how do we heal our communities and our different perspectives. And I think this is certainly a tool. It's a positive tool that can be brought. So much of when we talk about how do we bring our communities together to heal, people feel like there's judgments or I'm less than and this is one of those tools that can be packaged more as an empowerment tool and really that changes your life. Yeah. Talk one a little bit more about what do you do if you are in a position right now um, speaking about communities that may be disadvantaged or kids that are in that environment? If you don't have money, it, what do you do? How do you begin to plan? Yeah, it's tough. And I know you're, we have a shared message of empowerment right? Ours is economic empowerment. Yours is too. Ours is economic empowerment through financial education, through financial knowledge. Um, and what we find, and it's really interesting, you know, in the lower socioeconomic communities, we find the students and the people there, they actually know a lot more about personal finances than the people in the higher socioeconomic area. 
And I saw that time and time again, you know, where they had that knowledge because they knew budgeting, they knew those things, but where they lacked was hope. Oh, the question we asked when we did it, this question, it was like, uh, you know, if you save a hundred dollars a month over, you know, 50 years, what would that turn into right at a six, 8% interest rate, just kind of a question. And we do a class on that and we teach them. So this is the post-test. And in the higher economic areas, most people got that right. The answer was over a million, right? But uh, uh, the lower socioeconomic areas, it was under 30%. And we're like, why is that? And it was over and over. So what we had to do is they didn't believe it. They did not think that was possible. So we actually had to do a much more extended class where they got on their uh, compound interest calculator. They saw the numbers. They saw that work out. And these eyes lit up. They're like, no way, right? But when we trained in a class just out as we normally did, it just kind of glazed over. They, they didn't really believe it. But when we had them experience, that's possible. So the younger we can get to them, the more hope we can instill, um, the better. And I think that's a part on the, the parents' role, the, the school's role, and also, as you mentioned, the community groups. We serve a lot of nonprofits, a lot of faith-based groups, a lot of people that just are concerned about kids today um, and their feeling of, hey, not being worthy enough to have money and have that security because maybe they didn't grow up that way. Uh, but I think through this economic empowerment, through education, entrepreneurship, education, career planning, financial education, we can really strengthen communities from the inside out. And it just it helps everybody, not only the individual, their families, because we, we see a spillover effect, right? Mm-hmm. They're, doing, they're doing better financially. They can help family and friends. It helps the city, the town, the community because of tax base. Um, and it just has a great spillover effect that can have positive uh, ramifications for many years to come. So Vince, this has been a wonderful conversation. For those of you who are listening, we will have information about Vince in the show notes. I encourage you to look him up. Incredible resource. He has lots and lots and lots and lots of information on his um, site that's available to people. And then of course, his coaches. So um, please feel free to, to look at that and to use him as a resource because we can get through this economic time if people choose to gain financial wisdom. And here's a great resource. So Vince, thank you so much for being with us today. It was great being here. Thanks for having me and I appreciate all you do for the community. You are so welcome. And for those of you who are listening to Building My Legacy podcast today, thank you for being with us. And remember to visit us at our website, buildtomorrow.com with the number two and also start with collaboration. So again, Vince, thank you so much. Thanks again. You've been listening to Building My Legacy podcast with Dr. Lois Sonstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sonstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.